Well, we're back again, and uh, so far we've talked about uh, why medical terminology is important. We've talked about some rules of medical terminology, how to put words together. We've talked about basic word parts, word roots, uh, combining vowels, suffixes, and prefixes. But we want to spend a little bit more time on this video talking about prefixes and give me a little bit more extensive list about what prefixes really are. But So let's go over a little bit about what a, what a prefix really is. And we'll give you, uh, again, a number of uh, prefixes that can be used uh, quite commonly. In medical terminology. Again, when we talked about words, okay, medical term terms, you know, I can't say, I can't, I can't cross out that all, but medical terms, many medical terms have a root, and that's our word root, like we talked about, okay? And if I have a word root, according to the first rule we even talked about, is if you have a word root, it has to be finished off with a suffix. So, you know, so that, that suffix is what follows that word root. Not all medical terms need to have a prefix. In fact, many medical terms do not. But the idea behind a prefix, like I talked about in an earlier presentation, is it just makes the word much more descriptive, okay? So by adding a prefix, it gives a, a more precise, more definitive definition of what that word really is. And that's where the prefix really comes in. A couple things about a prefix is the meaning of a, a prefix is constant. It's always gonna be the same, okay? There might be a couple of them that might have a couple different associated meanings, but basically Basically, the, the, the meaning of a particular prefix is constant. So what's the importance there? Hey, if you learn them and you know them, guess what? You're in good shape. You'll remember them forever. So that's way, and it's not going to change from time to time or from word to word. So what the prefix means is always the same, as we mentioned. And again, if, for example, if I see the prefix epi, epi always means upon. Okay, so if I see some a word with epi, uh, like epidermis, epidermis is the part of the skin that's upon the layer below, which is called the dermis. It's upon the dermis. Okay, a uh, word like hypo, hypo always means under, below, beneath, or less than normal. We talked about that earlier with hypoglycemia, a low or beneath or less than normal blood sugar level. Okay, so what happens is the use of a prefix will change the description of the word root because it just much make, makes it much more specific. And that's why a lot of words do have prefixes in them, which is actually a pretty good thing. So let's look at some examples of prefixes, okay? Now, this is a word root. Word root cost means rib, okay? So cost means rib. So if you see a word that has cost in it, you know, it has something to do, to do with a rib. And I know if I have a word root, what do I need? Of course, I need a suffix. I need to finish it off. And what happens is we've added just al. And we know al is an adjective suffix that means pertaining to. So what this word need, means now is pertaining to, because again, when we define a word, we start where? With a suffix and then go to the beginning. At this point, we start with the suffix, which is a, which means pertaining to, pertaining to a rib. But that could mean a lot of different things. It could mean many different things. So let's try to figure out what what is pertaining to a rib? And we can do that by adding a prefix. Here we add the prefix sub. Sub means below. So in other words, if something is subcostal, it's something below the rib. If I feel the edge of my ribs, my lower edge of the ribs where the chest meets the abdomen, that's called the subcostal margin. Okay, right there where they're, they're just below the ribs is called the subcostal margin, and or the subcostal region would be portion of the abdomen just just below the ribs. So sub means below. So now I'm taking that costal pertaining to rib, making it much more specific by adding a prefix here, sub, before the beginning of it. I could actually take that sub away, okay, and add another one, inter. Inter means between means between. So now I have a bigger, longer prefix, inter. Inter means between. If I feel be, if I feel my ribs, there's a gap between each of the ribs, and that's called the intercostal space. So the word after that would be space. Intercostal space comes in between there, and that means between the rib. The, the space between the ribs is called the intercostal space. Okay? So that's what we have have with that. So we've just changed the changed the um, uh, the prefix and it changes the meaning of the word significantly. But you know what? I could do this on and on and on. Let's take the inner out and let's add something else to that. Juxta. Juxta means near or beside. So something that would be near or beside a rib would be called juxtacostal. So basically, I'm, I'm manipulating this word and being precise as to where a location might be just by adding a prefix to costal, which means pertaining to the rib, which could mean, again, a myriad of things. Okay. A prefix is always at the beginning of the word. That makes it that, and that, you know why it does that? Because it's a prefix. Prefix is always right at the beginning of the word, whether it's English or whether it's medical terminology. Prefix are pre means before. And actually pre is a, is, is a prefix. Okay. Pre, P-R-E is a prefix, means which means before. So there you go. It all, it all comes together. What goes around comes around. Now, uh, we have a, a number of different types of prefixes. And we're going to go through some of these now. You know, we have a prefix that means a number. 
okay? Prefix that uh, pertain to certain types of measurements or volumes, okay? Uh, positions would be another way we have directions, negatives, colors, and then we have a whole list of others. So let's go through some of these prefixes, and I'm going to fill you with a long list. So if, you, if, you're, a, if you're a flashcard person, get your flashcards out ready and go, ready to go, because we're going to go through a, a long list of different types of prefixes that we have. Let's look at numbers, okay? Numbers, and some of these we've already had when we talked in our first our first uh, video. And by by we know means two or double. Um, there's a um, the mitral valve, which is a valve on the left side of the heart between the left atrium and the left ventricle, which you'll know by the end of the semester. Hopefully, if you don't, you're behind the learning curve. But it it has two two leaflets to it. Cus uh, Two cusps, they hang down like that and they open and close to let blood go through. And because it has two leaflets, it's called the bicuspid valve. There's one on the opposite side, on the right side of the heart, that has three leaflets. What do you think they call that? They call that a tricuspid valve. Okay, so bi means two, obviously. Hemi means half. Hemi means half. So hemi, if somebody is, has a hemiplegia, it plegia we talked about before means paralysis. If they're hemiplegic or they have a hemiplegia, an IA would be, an, um, would be a noun suffix. Hemiplegia would be paralysis of half the body, like the left, left side or the right side, half the body that way, left side or right side. Milli, milli means one thousandth, one thousandth of something, okay? A milliliter is one thousandth of a liter. A millimeter is one thousandth of a meter. Okay, so it's a very small thing. It's one thousandth of something. Okay, mono also means one. Mononuclear. Okay, mononuclear. Um, most cells are mononuclear. Okay, um, and basically that just means they have one nucleus. Okay, most cells are like that. So uh, you think of mononucleosis. Actually, mononucleosis. There's there are cells which are called monocytes. Mononucleosis does not involve monocytes. It actually involves lymphocytes, but that's beside the point. Okay, forget. <laughs> Let me take that back. And I didn't really say that. But mono means one. Okay, makes makes sense. Nulli means none. Nulli para. Uh, para. Okay, means delivery. Okay, not like uh, Amazon or or, uh, you know, uh, Uber Eats or something like that, but delivery in regards to a child, okay? So if someone, if a lady is nullipara or nulliparous, it means that she's never had a, a delivery before, okay? So basically, uh, nulli means none, means none, okay? Think about that. The, what, if you watch English soccer, nil, you know, nil means null, none, okay, zero, okay? Primi means first, means first. Uh, let's go back to that pregnant female. If it's her first, first pregnancy, it's called a prima gravita because gravita means pregnancy. Gravita means pregnancy. So first pregnancy would be called prima gravita. So if someone has a, has a you know, describe a female as prima gravita, it means it's her first pregnancy. She's pregnant now and it's the first time. Quadri we know means four, quadriplegia. Well, plesia we talked up here means paralysis. Now quadriplegia is someone who would be paralyzed in all four extremities all four extremities, okay? Semi, also something that means half. Now, I hate this word right here, semi-lunar. Semi also means half, just like hemi. Um, semi-lunar valves are basically, um, you know, lunar means moon, okay? If you think of a half moon, it should be like this. Problem is that the semi-lunar valves, which are in the heart, which we'll talk about, you know, in, a, in about uh, another month and a half to two months, what happens is they don't have two leaflets, they have three leaflets. So some, somebody screwed up there in that name. But semi also means half means half. Tetra also means four. Tetraplasia, I wouldn't think of that. I'd think, say, quadriplasia is most commonly word than, than tetraplasia. Tetracycline. Tetracycline is something that has four molecules, uh, four rings on it, okay? So basically, that's where they get that. So tetra means four, means four, okay? So both quadri and tetra mean four. So we have some of these prefixes. Somebody actually wanted to make some new names, so I guess they added a different one. So tetra and quadra both mean four. Tri means three. Triceps, triceps. Uh, triceps are the muscle at the back of the arm, okay? And they call it the triceps because um, seps means head. And what happens, the triceps muscle actually attaches down by the elbow, right back in here by what's called the olecranon, attaches by this tendon right here. But when it goes up towards the shoulder, it actually divides into three different heads. These three different heads, one of them attached, or two of them attached directly to the humerus, and one of them attaches down to the bottom portion of the scapula or the shoulder blade. Okay, and so it basically has three heads, so they call it the triceps. So on the front, they call it the what? Biceps. How many heads do you think the biceps has? It has two muscle heads because it's the biceps. And uni also means one, just like a unifocal one focus. Okay. So these are some number prefixes, and they're commonly used. We'll see these multiple times over and over and over again. Okay. Uh, we have some measurement prefixes. These usually more tell something about volume or the amount. 
as compared to actual number like we talked about before. And hyper we've had before means excessive. Hyperlipidemia. Now, emia we had as a suffix, which no, we know means blood, means blood. So I have something to do with blood. Hyper means excessive. And now I think about lipid. Lipid means fat. So people who have high blood fats or blood lipids, it's called hyperlipidemia. Hyperlipidemia. That's where that word would come from. It makes sense. Emia, we start with the suffix. Emia, blood. Hype, go to the beginning, hyper, high lipids, high lipids in the blood. Makes sense, okay? Uh, hype, H-Y-P, means under, below, or beneath, okay? And this word right here, hypoxemia, hypoxemia. Um, and again, we get our emia. Emia means blood. Hype means low or below or beneath. And ox means oxygen. So when people have low oxygen levels in the blood, it's called hypoxemia, emia, blood, hype, low, e ox, oxygen. Okay, so that's that. And also hypo means under, below, or beneath. Hypoglossal, hypoglossal. The word al is what? It's an adjective suffix. Glosso means tongue. And what happens is something that's below the tongue would be called hypoglossal, hypoglossal. Um, there's a nerve that comes directly from the brain. It's called the, tenth, uh, the 12th cranial nerve or the hypoglossal nerve that actually goes to the tongue. And what the hypoglossal nerve does, it does this. Make sure you stick your tongue out, okay? And what happens, they can check there's a hypoglossal nerve on the right side, a hypoglossal nerve on the left side. And if one is paralyzed, if this one over here on my on my, on my particular right side, which is on the left side of the screen, on the right side is paralyzed, what happens is when I ask it to stick the tongue out, it goes, because this side doesn't push out. The muscle will, when the muscle is stimulated by the nerve, it's going to push it out. If this side's not pushing out, the other side does over here. It goes like that. It's pushing it out. So anyway, but that's beside the point. You don't have to remember that. But the word hypo means below or beneath. We're gonna. This is a very commonly used prefix. Multi again we had before means mer, means many. Multiparous where we had uh, um, you know uh, nulliparous before. Okay, none. Now multi means many, many many deliveries. Uh, someone who said oh, what's the the Duggars or whatever this with the. 65 kids or whatever it was. I don't know what it is. And it wasn't that many, you know, probably only in the 40s. I don't know what it was. But anyway, you know, multiparous means many deliveries. Okay. So multi means many. And poly also means many. Polyuria. Urea means urination. I-A or I-A would, would be a noun suffix. And ur means urine. Okay. So polyuria is in a situation where somebody has to urinate a lot. Uh, people with diabetes, they have frequency of urination. They have to pass their urine a lot more, and that's just called polyuria. Okay, so polyuria is is another for is another measurement prefix. We also have direction or positional type things. Okay, uh, ab ab means away from. Okay, uh, if, if you if someone is taken, they're abducted, and what do you do? You take them away. So that's an easy way to remember. So ab means away from. Okay, so abduct. If I take my arm and raise my arm out to the side, my arm is being abducted because it's moving away from my body. So away from something is ab. Ab means moving away from something. On the opposite to that, if I remember ab. Add is going to be just the opposite. Add means toward, it, towards, it, in, it increases, it brings it back towards the body, okay? Toward is basically. So when the arm goes out, that's abduction. You have sometimes instructors will say abduction, uh, which is basically abduction. Or when the body, when the arm comes back towards the side of the body, that's called adduction or adduction. They usually say ad because if you say it real fast, ab or ad, it's hard to tell what you're telling. So I say abduction or adduction because it's easier to know. And adduction is is, is bringing the, the arm back to the side. Okay, so that's that. Um, so ab and ad, they're just sort of opposite of each other. Ambi, ambi means both sides, both sides. Okay, so what's ambidextrous mean? Ambidextrous means that you could use your right hand like your left hand. Well, where did this word come from? Okay, interesting enough, okay, and, and I guess this is a derivation. This is pretty much what, what I would think. But if I look, this part right here, D-E-X-T-R. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. That's too too crazy. Let me do it with a pen here. D-E-X-T-R. D-E-X-T-R. And that word stands for right. So if I'm looking at this word, ambidextrous means almost like using both arms like you use the right. Assuming the right arm in the right hand is the right one, okay? The right side, not correct, but the right side. Because we know everybody, we know being left-handed is abnormal. Um, no, I don't mean that. I, that was just a 
facetious uh, little statement. It's not, I have a sister who's left-handed. She's not normal. No, she is normal. She's pretty good, okay? But it basically, ambidextrous is like almost like, like using both sides like the right because the right is, is okay. But anyway, Dexter, in fact, when you go to the eye doctor, I'm just going to give you a little hint here. You probably don't, it probably has nothing to do with what we have. We'll, do, we'll talk about these in abbreviations. What happens is what happens when they do your eye exam and you're getting glasses or contacts. What they'll do is you give you a prescription and one would be OD, okay? And OD stands for ocular dexter. What eye do you think that is? That's the right eye, because dexter means right eye. The other one on the on the other side is OS. O S. Now that gives me to a big question. What does that S mean? It goes back to that conspiracy like everything should be right handed. O S means ocular sinister. Sinister means left. Hmm, see, I knew I was right, so I'm glad I'm right-handed, um, but anyway, that's not true, okay? Left-handed people are fine. Um, we don't throw them down the well anymore or sacrifice those children anymore. They're, we keep them, okay? So anyway, that's that. So ambidextrous, ambi means both. Let's get back to what we're supposed to talk about instead of a little worthless bandering. But ambi means both, okay? So if you see ambi, it means both. Um, so that's that, okay? Uh, anti. Anti, we had this one before, means before or in front. The area, if you have, if people draw blood, you know, they draw blood from this this area in the front of the elbow, and that's called the anticubital fossa. The area of the elbow is called the cubital region. The area before that, right in front of that, is called the anticubital region. The upper arm is called the brachium. The forearm is called the hmm, antibrachium because it's before. Sometimes when you go into a big building, before you go into the major room, you go into a smaller room before that, which is called the ante room because ante means before. Or let's say if you're a poker player, and what do you do? You ante up. You throw the ante in, which is before you actually make the play of your cards. You know, I'm not a card player, but that's what I guess they say. So ante means before or in front of something. Circum means around. Means around. Okay. Circumduction. Um, you know, basically, uh, uh, if you think of uh, this is easy word to remember because if I take a circle, the area around the circle is what? The circumference, circumference, so around the outside. So circumduction, if I took my arm and rotated it around a big circle, that's called circumduction, circumduction, okay? So that's another word. D, D means down from, and it's easy, descending. You're coming downstairs, it's descending. Um, uh, they have a, uh, there's an artery that comes down the front of the heart, it's called left anterior descending. And that's an artery that goes downwards, goes from the middle of the heart down to the very point of the heart, the bottom, which is called the apex. We'll talk about that later. So that's what D is. Dia, 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 dia means through, means through. And that's where we get the word diagnosis, diagnosis. Now, this word has a very interesting um, uh, origin. Gnosis, gnosis is a word that means, get this, knowledge, knowledge. Okay, so diagnosis means through knowledge. And what this means is a diagnosis is once a practitioner evaluates what you have, looks at the lab tests, and, and gathers all the knowledgeable information that they could get about a person's condition, they can make and tell them what it is. And it's that the diagnosis is through knowledge, through knowledge. So that they get diagnosis is through through knowledge, okay? So dia means through, okay? So if you look at uh, a circle, if going back to that circle, if I have a circle here, we have the circumference, but if I go across right there, that's the what? Diameter, it's through the center. So dia means through, okay? Ecto, ecto, ecto means outside, okay? And I should have actually had the TO here um, uh, in, in red, ectopic. Ectopic is something that occurs outside the normal place, like an ectopic pregnancy. Most pregnancies, what happens is fertilization occurs in what's called the fallopian tubes, and that fertilized ovum then comes in and plants in the side or the inside wall of the uterus, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it stays in the fallopian tube and starts to grow. It implants itself in the wall of the fallopian tube, or sometimes it goes out the other end of the fallopian tube and ends up in the abdominal cavity, which it shouldn't be. Uh, all those, uh, every, every one of those fetus would be non-viable. They're not going to survive. Okay, and it's called an ectopic pregnancy because it's outside the normal location, and basically at a certain point they get to a certain certain size and they basically rupture, which might be a risk to the um, um, maternal health, okay, or maternal life. Let me put it that way. So that's called ectopic. Sometimes when people have these little extra heartbeats, they're called ectopic beats because they're not coming from the right place where normal heartbeats come from. So ecto means outside, means outside, okay. Endo means within means within. Uh, inside the heart is an inside lining, and the inside lining, because cardi means heart, inside lining of the heart is called the endo 
endocardium, endocardium. When they take a tube and put it down your throat, a breathing tube, it's called an endotracheal tube because it's within the trachea or the windpipe. Okay, so these are a couple more position or directional prefixes, but you know what? The list goes on and on and on and on. So we got some more here. Epi, we talked about this means upon or over. Epidural. Um, when people have um, like a, a, a delivery, and what they do is they sometimes have an epidural. Okay. Well, I had an epidural, and say, say, oh great, and nobody knows what it is. You know, they say, hey, well, how'd you have your baby? I had an epidural. Well, you know, they know they were numb. What happens? They take a needle and stick it in, and they stick it around this membrane that's around the spinal cord and around the nerves that are coming out of the spinal cord, because also surrounds the brain. It's called the dura. So they take the local anesthetic and put it around this membrane, which then gets through the membrane and actually causes a numbness of the nerve, okay, or, or a group of nerves, and it's called epidural because it's a pond. There's a membrane on the outside of the heart. It's called the epicardium, okay. So epi means over or upon, okay. X means outside or away from, okay, or out. If you do something excise, you know, it means to take something out. You remove something. You take out, excise a tumor or whatever the case may be. Excise the tonsils or whatever, you know. So basically, uh, excise, X, X means out, away from, or outside. Exo also means outside or outward. Something that's exogenous, um, a genus means formation or where it's generated from or formed from, okay, or produced from. If something's exogenous, it's actually formed outside the body and, and put into the body, okay? Uh, sometimes when, you know, our body makes normal cortisone, okay, it's called cortisol in our adrenal glands that help us to respond to stress and stuff like that. But what happens is sometimes people need more uh, cortisone that's supplied by injection or by, uh, by a tablet or something like that. And that would be an exogenous source of that cortisone because it's coming from outside. It's made on the outside and it's delivered to the inside of the body. So exo means outside or outward. Extra means outside or beyond as well. Something that would be extra hepatic would be outside the liver easy. We talked about hypo before, under, below, beneath. Hypothermic. Hypotherm means temperature. Some is hypothermic. It means their temperature is low. Okay. Hypothermia, hypothermic. Okay. In means, oh, in. <laughs> we'll go figure that one. So in means in or inside or within. Intubate. When they put a tube in something, you know what they call that? Intubation. Okay. Because they're putting a tube where? In. So in means in. That, guess which one's not going to be on the exam? That that you might as well forget that. But in means in, okay? Infra means below or beneath or under. Infra patellar, infra patellar, patellar is the is the kneecap. A R is uh, is an adjective suffix, okay? A R and infra means below the level of the patella or the kneecap. So the area below that you feel a tendon, and that's the infra patellar tendon that would be sitting there just below the kneecap. Okay, so infra means below, beneath, or under. Under. Inter we had before was between, intercostal we had that one before, so I don't need to spend time. Intra means within, intravenous. Venus, O-U-S, adjective suffix, pertaining to intra, within, vein, vein. Okay, so when they put a IV in there, IV stands for intravenous. Okay, we had juxta here, which means near or beside. Juxta articular. Ar articular means joint. Okay, we had arthro meaning joint. Articular also means joint. AR is an adjective suffix, meaning pertaining to. Pertaining to near a joint. So sometimes people have what's called extra articular or juxta articular uh, erosion. Sometimes with rheumatoid arthritis, the inflammation of the rheumatoid actually takes out chunks of bone right at the edge of the joint. And because it's right at the edge of the joint, right next beside the joint is called juxtarticular erosions. Okay, so juxta means near or beside. Near side. Okay, Oop. and the list goes on. Meso, meso means middle, means middle. Okay, uh, Mesoamerica, you know, the, te the Central America sometimes Mesoamerica stuff like that. Uh, we have mesoderm, which is actually a level of embryonic tissue called the mesoderm. But that's meso just means middle. Remember that. Para means beside, near, beyond. Paravertebral. If we look at the back, on both sides of the back. You have the you feel these little bumps right straight up the back, which are, are part of the vertebrae. Okay, that stick out. It's called the spinous process. And then adjacent to the vertebra to these spines, you feel this big hump. And that big hump are the paravertebral muscles that hold your back upright. Okay, and they're called paravertebral muscles because they're near beside the vertebrae. 
Okay, so para means near, beside, or beyond. Peri means around, means around. Something that would be perineural, A-L adjective suffix again. Neural means nerve. Something that would be around a nerve would be called perineural. They, they have something that was called a neuroma. You get them frequently in the feet and other places, places uh, in the body, and they're called perineural fibromas. Fibroma would be the noun, and, per, and perineural would be an adjective, because A-L is an adjective suffix, and peri means around the nerve. It's basically just scar tissue around the nerve, okay? Pre means before or in front of, precordial. When they do uh, an electrocardiogram, they put uh, uh, electrodes on the chest here and usually on the lower abdomen or the legs, sometimes on the arms and sometimes on the legs, but then they put a series of 6 to 12 electrodes along the chest and those uh, on the chest are called precordial leads leads would be the noun and IAL is an adjective suffix pertaining to before and cordy is also a word root that also means heart cardi means heart cordy means heart okay so something these leads that are around the chest are called precordial leads because they're before or in front of the heart okay and they actually look at the heart from a different different viewpoint okay when they take electrocardiogram we'll talk more about electrocardiograms later on in the course pro means before or in front of before or in front of and prognosis now i mentioned before that gnosis means knowledge okay so what a prognosis is is it's a guess as to what's going to happen down the road before you really know what's going to happen it's before knowing what's happening down the road you're making a guess so you're making a prognosis of something so it's before or in before or in front of the actual knowledge of what's going to happen it's sort of a, an estimate or a guess and that's called a prognosis because pro means before or in front see hopefully all these prefix start to make a lot of sense to you re means to do something again back again redo recannulate cannula is, is a tube if they had to put a cannula back in again it's called recannulation that's not a common one okay retro retro means backward behind retro sternal al adjective suffix okay sternal means the breastbone Okay, and something that would be retrosternal would be something that's behind the breastbone or the sternum, which is basically the heart. So a lot of times when people have a heart attack or heart pain, they have retrosternal discomfort or retrosternal pain or retrosternal crushing or something like that because it's behind the area of the sternal sternum so be, be and retro means backward or behind sub we had before means under below or beneath subdural now i mentioned dural before was a membrane that covers the spinal cord the, and and where the nerves start to come out of the spinal cord and also covers the brain it's a very thick dense membrane okay um it's called the dura okay uh and dura means like durable durable means very, very tough it's a really tough membrane and so sometimes what happens is old people and don't think about me right now but old people sometimes they fall we fall a lot okay and what happens is they sometimes they bang their head and when they bang their head sometimes they get some bleeding underneath that dura and that would be called a subdermal sub excuse me subdural hematoma there's a little commercial on tv where the lady's in a car and she sounds panicky and she has her dad with a with a with a, a washcloth or a towel on his head and he's bleeding and she says and she's on the phone she's calling something she shouldn't, shouldn't be calling and she should be but you know dad fell again and he's on a blood thinner well on the blood thinner basically he's gonna he's gonna bleed more okay and it's not really blood they're not really blood thinner they're anticoagulants they prevent the blood from 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 clotting they don't make the blood thinner or anything like that, but they just prevent the clotting and that's where we have the subdural hematoma that may occur happens a lot more in older people but it occurs with head injury where they have bleeding just between the brain and below the level of that dura okay that that dural membrane okay so that's just that but sub means below and you can remember that by submarine goes below the water level okay supra supra means above or over supra pubic which means pubic is the area is right where the pelvis comes together in the front okay um and that area is it's just the area above that is the supra pubic area i remember i had a um I, I had a heart attack when i was 36 and uh in 2000 uh, i had a defibrillator put in my chest so i have a little box in my chest that gives me a shock when my heart does some crazy things it's only happened a few times but it does anyway it went off a, num a number of years ago and i'm sitting in the emergency room waiting to go to ccu for a day or two until they could check things out make sure i was okay and they bring in this little guy look like mr burns they wheel him by my little uh, cubicle in the emergency room a guy you know a little laying on it, big wisp you know wispy hair big pointy nose and he's laying on it and they get him in the next cubicle and the nurse comes in 
and says, you know, uh, what's wrong, Mr. Such and Such? And he sits in this very feeble joy voice. He says, I haven't peed in six days or something like that. And basically they try to put a catheter in. His prostate was big. They couldn't get the urine out. Try to put a catheter and they couldn't get in because the prostate had closed off the tube, the urethra that goes from the bladder to the outside. So basically what they did is they did a supra pubic stick. They, actually took, took a little bit of a local anesthetic and numbed up the area of the skin down all the way to the muscle just above the level where the pubis comes together and they took a catheter and stuck it through the skin into the bladder to drain his bladder because his bladder was like he was probably choking on it maybe that's the problem i don't know but that's called super pubic because super means above the level of the pubis okay um so and then we've got another one trans trans means across or through Transmute. And probably Mr. Burns, after he had that, maybe had what's called a transurethral resection. Um, what they do is, in some people with big prostates, what they do is rather than going in surgically and taking the prostate out, because there's a lot of nerves there, when they go in and take the prostate out through an abdominal incision, what happens is as guys end up with uh, urinary incontinence, they dribble a lot, they have sexual dysfunction, they have all kinds of problems associated with that. Um, so basically what they do is they go in through the urethra with a tube, obviously, while they're asleep. They go through the urethra and scrape it out like a rotor rooter through the through the through the urethra to, to, to open it up and then they put like a stent or a tube in there and they leave that in there until that urethra reforms in a wider and then they pull it out okay so it's because it's across or through the urethra which is basically the tube that goes from the bladder to the outside it's called transurethral when they resect that tissue of the prostate through the tube so we also have prefixes that are related to colors. This might be a color of a lesion, might be a color of a particular fluid, and we have different names. And the first two are pretty simple. Alb and albino both mean white. Mean white. You could, that's easy to remember because albinism and albino basically have to do with, with, uh, with, with white. Chloro, chloro means green like chlorophyll, you know, chlorophyll, uh, that's what's in, in plants to give plants that greenish color, okay? So chloro means means green. Cero, cero means yellow or tawny. And that's where we get the word cirrhosis. Uh, osis means condition. We talked about that as a suffix, which you should have learned in the suffix video. What happens is when the, when the liver starts to become damaged either by alcoholism or by uh, hepatitis or infection stuff like that what happens the liver starts to scar if you look at a good healthy piece of liver it's a dark brownish red okay you've seen liver sitting you know cow liver cow liver and stuff like that at the supermarket and stuff like that i can't stand even the smell of that stuff but what happens is as this as the liver becomes damaged these these liver cells start to become destroyed and, and the liver gets replaced by scar and and what happens is this scar gives a, a more of a yellow or tannish color to the to the liver and it's it's hard and it's lumpy it's not smooth and shiny and glistening and dark red and reddish brown but smaller and yellowish more looking and lumpy and hard okay and that's what we see with cirrhosis Cirro means this yellow or tawny color now, there's a common uh, prefix cyan cyan means blue cyanosis is when you, you your, your oxygen levels are low and you get that blue tinge to the lips and the fingernails and stuff like that gets sort of blue and that's called cyanosis cyanosis it's a bluish tinge to something eosinophil means rosy or red okay and eosinophil eosinophil is basically a, a white blood cell when you say white blood cell that is red what happens is when i look at these white blood cells and eosinophil they stain them and when they stain them they're a bunch of red granules now if you look at the eosinophil there'll be eosinophil right there and then inside there there'll be these little red granules all over inside they stain red and when you look at it underneath the microscope, they're all stained red. And because it stains red, it's called an eosinophil. Basically, we see eosinophils in cases of people with parasites and allergies are the biggest probably thing. Uh, if you've seen a commercial, there's a commercial. Uh, and, and this is some of the time, you know, I, I hate commercials. I fast forward through commercials and stuff. I hate to watch commercials. Most of them are garbage. But if you remember, there was a commercial about asthma. And if you have an, an asthma associated with high level of eosinophil counts, well, basically it makes sense because a lot of people with asthma also have what? allergies and the allergies allergies trigger the asthma so basically these people have a higher than normal number of these eosinophils these white cells with these red granules when they stain them so eosino means red or rose okay we go on here a couple more erythro erythro also means red okay red blood cells are called erythrocyte site means cell Erythro means red, red cells. So erythrocell, red blood cell is called an erythrocyte. Gloco, 
Glaucoma means silver or gray. And that's where we get to glaucoma. Now, a lot of people don't really know what glaucoma is, okay? But what happens if I, and let me just explain a little bit about glaucoma and what it is. Let me just draw a picture of an eye here, okay? If I draw a picture of an eye here, what happens is here's the, here's the iris, okay? And that's the colored portion of the eye. This area out here is the cornea. This area right here would be the cornea. Here would be the iris, okay? And then a hole in the center of it would be the pupil. And right behind that is a lens. Okay, what happens is the area out here in the cornea, okay, between the cornea and the iris is called the anterior chamber. And what happens is it makes fluid to keep that area puffed up and full and stuff like that. Well, that fluid, you make fluid, you have to take away fluid, it has to drain. And right at the corner, right in these areas, right here where the ends are, right where the where the iris or the colored part of the eye meets the corneum, okay? Basically, there are small little holes. They're called, believe it or not, they're called the canals of Schlem. I don't know whoever gave it that name, probably Mr. Schlem, but the canals of Schlem. And these canals of Schlem will drain that fluid out. It drains it under a little membrane that covers the whole eye, okay? But sometimes these areas, these little holes, the drain don't drain. As a result, the fluid builds up in this anterior chamber and the pressure gets higher and higher. When you go to the eye doctor and they check for glaucoma, they have that little puff of air that they uh, puff at your eye. And that, that measures the amount of pressure in that anterior chamber, just this part right here. As this pressure increases, it also starts to put pressure backwards in here. And back here on the retina is where all the visual neural receptors are that give me my vision. Okay, So eventually that glaucoma will affect your vision by putting pressure in this, this chamber here but basically glaucoma is a problem here and sometimes people actually get a little bit of a cloudiness it's not a cataract cataracts occur because of a cloudiness of the lens back in here but in here sometimes they get sort of like a misty appearance which is basically where they get the word glaucoma because glaucoma means silver or gray okay uh, jondo jondo means yellow means yellow okay and that's where we get the word jaundice jaundice is that yellowish discoloration that we get um, when we usually have liver disease and stuff like that, what will happen is the, <coughs> the skin develops this yellowish color, which is actually sort of interesting how that happens. What happens is the yellowish is, is, is the yellow color of the skin is due to a yellow pigment, which is called bilirubin. Okay, bilirubin. Okay, and what happens is the liver can't handle the bilirubin. The bilirubin levels build up in the blood. As the bilirubin levels build up in the blood, they circulate throughout the body and they get outside the blood vessels and give the give the skin that yellowish color. They give the skin, the whites of the eye become yellow, the roof of the mouth becomes more yellow, the skin creases in the hands, and the feet become much more yellow. And that's called jaundice. Okay, and that's because the bilirubin builds up in the blood. There's a long story beside that, and we'll talk about that when we get to the GI system. But but jaundice is basically this bilirubin builds up and it's a yellowish brown pigment and that's what causes this yellowish discoloration of the skin okay but uh, where that bilirubin comes from is really uh, a, a fascinating story it actually comes from blood cells red blood cells red blood cells when they die they're picked up by the spleen the spleen like slices and dices them and sends them away okay and sends them over to the liver they take the iron out of the red blood cells and recycle it so they could put it into new red blood cells that's a, that are occurring and being formed in the bone marrow then the other protein part of the red blood cell goes to the liver and the liver makes something called biliverdin and biliverdin is basically the precursor to bilirubin the liver converts the biliverdin into bilirubin and the bilirubin then actually part of it gets shoved up into the area of the gallbladder and it's uh, mixed with cholesterol and stuff on the, on its way up there and it comes and it becomes what we call bile okay and sometimes people have you know nausea and they have this brownish uh, bitter taste and stuff that they will vomit sometimes that's bile and what bile serves its purpose for is when we eat a fatty meal the gallbladder squeezes squeezes the bile out into the first portion of the small intestine called the duodenum to help to break down the fat it more liquefies it okay so the bile helps to uh, helps us to digest fat so we really do need this <laughs> and then it's interesting because the bilirubin that's made into the bile gets into the gi system some of it gets absorbed back in the intestine and goes back and makes and helps to make new you know blood cells and stuff like that you know new red blood cells but some of it stays in the intestines and bacteria in, uh, involve you know sort of like uh, uh interact with this bile that's in the, it, actually it's not bile, it's been converted by various enzymes in the bacteria, convert to something else. And basically that's what causes bowel movements to be brown. 
the brown bowel movements are because of the bile reacting with the bacteria in the gut with the food that makes bowel movements brown. When people have gallbladder disease, okay, and they don't excrete the bile, one of the things that they frequently notice is their stools become clay colored, they become lighter. Why? Because they're not, they, if, if there's a stone or something that's blocking the gallbladder being able to put the bile into the small intestine to help to digest the fats, Okay, or, or to break down the fats, basically there's no bile there, so therefore there's nothing to color bowel movements brown. So be happy if you have brown bowel movements because that's a good thing, okay? If you consider that, you know, so don't go tell your friends and neighbors, hey, I, happy day, you know, my, bra, my bowel movements are brown. They'll immediately have you committed somewhere, so don't do that. But that's that's the story about that. We'll talk more about that later on in a little bit more detail. Ludio, ludio means yellow, means yellow, okay? Luteo means yellow, okay? Uh, something called the corpus luteum. Corpus means body. Luteo means a yellow body. And what happens is um, where this corpus luteum comes from is at the time of ovulation, what happens is the ovary has a certain number of fixed number of ovum. And each month um, in uh, a female who are, who are fertile, what they do is they develop a couple of these ovum. And the ovum work their way to the side of the ovary around the fifth, fifth, 14th day of the month. And as they work to the side of the ovum, they actually get to the side and they get spurred out at the middle. And that's called ovulation. That's why sometimes it's actually the ovum being expelled from the ovary. That's why sometimes there's a little bit of cramping like in the mid cycle, simply because that's the ovulation period where the ovum be expelled. Then there's a little gap right where those ovum were. And that fills with this corpus luteum, this corpus luteum, which is a yellow material that fills this little hole. And that corpus luteum then starts to help and make a, a hormone called progesterone, which actually helps the uterus to be a nice uh, inhabitable place for if there is a pregnancy, if there's a fertilization of the ovum, it'll stick in the uterus, okay? Makes it a little sticky, makes it nice, nicer on the inside wall. But it's basically a yellow body that you can see under the microscope at that point. So it's called the corpus. Corpus means body, luteum means yellow, okay? Leuco, leuco means white. Leucocyte would be a white blood cell, okay? besides whether they stain. Some of them stain neutral, which are called neutrophils. Some stain red, which are called eosinophils. And some of them stain very dark or black or purple, which are called basophils, okay? And other ones are lymphocytes, which we won't talk about. But leukocytes are all the white blood cells. There's multiple, there's like five different types of, major types of white blood cells, but there's many subdivisions of those white blood cells that we have. So leuco means white, melano means black. Okay, and this is where we get the term melanoma. Melanoma um, is something we don't joke about. Melanoma is a highly, highly, highly malignant uh, tumor. Okay, uh, it's uh, it, the lesion doesn't have to be big. It could be a the size that maybe a little bit bigger than the tip of my marker right here, my screen marker, um, and it could kill you. Okay, and basically what happens is these are types of tumors which involve some of the pigment, pigmented cells of the skin and creates what's called a melanoma. Mel melano means black. These, these, uh, the lesions look very, they look like a mole, but it's very unusual color. Sometimes they're, they're, they're purplish. Sometimes they're very black. They look like this, the, like the colors leaching out into the skin around it, uh, very unusual shapes and stuff like that. And what happens, they have a tendency to spread. That word of spreading of, of by, just for your information, when a cancer spreads from its primary site to somewhere else is called metastasis. Metastasis. So if you admit metastasis, it's gone to somewhere else. And these melanomas are highly lethal. Okay, I know a couple of people who have died of melanomas, and young, it could affect young people as well as old people. A lot of times, red hair people. I hope you don't have red hair. If you do, I, I can't say dye it'll help. Okay, uh, dye, you know, dye your hair. It's not going to help. But what happens is uh, the, uh, the pigment in the skin that much more likely of developing melanomas. Uh, two people I know. One person my son played hockey with, and his daughter both had melanomas and succumbed from melanoma. Okay. Um, so I had, I, I think the last five months I was in practice, I had five melanomas. Okay. And all the people, it was well past the point of no return. And the oncol I sent to the oncologist and stuff like that because there really was a, a difficult time. Okay. So anyway, melano means black. Okay. Polio means gray. Poliomyelitis. We hear a little bit about that, but not a whole lot. Itis means inflammation. Myelo means spinal cord means spinal cord. And polio means in the spinal cord, there's this gray area. And what happened is they found out that the poliomyelitis was a virus that affected the gray area of the spinal cord that resulted in damage or destruction of that gray area of the spinal cord. And certain neural tracts or certain nerve tracts run in this gray matter. And that would result in paralysis and things like that. So that's where that comes from. So polio means gray. Purple, guess what purple means? It means purple. 
Okay. Sometimes these pe people get these big purple blotches on their skin, and that's called purpura. Okay, not uh, not birthmarks. Well, birthmarks could be sometimes called a purple, but there are other diseases that may cause blood to leak out. It looks like a big blood clot on the skin, and because they're purple, it's called purpura. Rubio also means red. Means red. Rubella. Rubella. What's rubella? Rubella is German measles. Why do they call it rubella? Because the rash is sort of a reddish rash. Okay, it's that uh, people worry about rubella. Okay, and uh, they say, oh, it's bad stuff. Actually, people aren't very sick with rubella. The problem you go with rubella is the offspring of moms who um, get rubella. That the virus may be transmitted across the placenta and affect the baby, which results in a lot of birth defects. But people who have rubella, they're not that sick. Their temperature's not that high. They don't they don't have that much of a problem normally. The problem we have is the other type of, of measles, which is called rubiola. Rubiola. Rubiola has high fevers, long term, you know, seven to ten days, being really sick, and may cause death. Okay, and that's why people, when they talk about vaccinations, they say, ah, oh, you know, people are dying across the world who refuse to be vaccinated, and they get vaccinated by what's called the M M R measles, mumps. And rubella, and this measles right here is the rubiola. The rub uh, rubella is this one right here. And basically, when they refuse to take that uh, rubiola, this part right here of the vaccine, the M first M, basically um, uh, they expose the kid to possibly having some really severe problems. And and, it's, and if the kids live, uh, they frequently have brain damage with it. So it's I mean not always, but sometimes they do. Okay. So rub ruby rubio means Ruby means red. Just think about ruby. What's a ruby like? You know, it's red. Xantho means yellow. Sometimes you see these old folks. And they have these yellow things around the inside of the eyes, you know, just along the skin, around the eyes. They're called xanthomas. They get them on the back of the heels. And they're basically yellow fatty masses that are there that mean absolutely nothing, except they're probably old. Okay. But that's xantho means yellow. Okay. We have some negative prefixes. Okay. Negative prefixes. A. A means not, no, with an apnea. We had that one before. Means without breathing. Okay. So A and A N also means without. Anesthesia without sensation. Anesthesia means sensation or sensory perception. Anesthesia what means without sensation. Ana also means not or without. Anaplasia. Anaplasia. Plasia means formation. Anaplasia means without formation. And we find in some uh, tumors, what happens is they call the cells anaplastic, or they describe anaplasia in these cells because the cells don't look like they normally should. They have abnormal or, or, or without normal formation. So ana means not or without. Anti means against. Antibiotic, we talked about that, against something that's living. It, yeah, uh, antibiotics work against bacteria. They don't work against viruses. Viruses are never alive to start out with. So antibiotics are worthless against the virus, but they can help bacteria okay and kill some bacteria there's multiple ways i can spend hours just talking about how certain antibiotics work because all the they all work a little bit different but the purpose is if they have a, if they have a bacteria what a lot of these antibiotics do is they actually start to punch holes or, or um, make holes in the cell membrane of the bacteria which decreases the integrity of the cell of the bacteria and the bacteria will die because of that contra contra means against like contraceptive contraceptives is something against conception Septive means conception against conception contraceptive okay this means to free of or to undo it like a discharge when somebody's a discharge they're getting rid of something they're free of they're getting free of or they're releasing that okay m means not okay impotence means they're not potent so m means not in means inside we talked about that before intima intima is the inside lining of an artery okay and the inside lining is which is is basically consistent with the inside lining of the heart but the inside lining is called the intima intima it's the inside lining because it's inside or within non means not Something that's not non-invasive means it's not in, not invasive. Uh, so if you stick a needle in somebody, guess what? That's invasive. If you do an ultrasound, even though the ultrasound penetrates through, it's still non-invasive, okay? Because it's not really damaging anything going through the skin. So non means not. Guess what? We have other common prefixes here, and it'll be done pretty soon. Auto. Auto means self, okay? Auto means self. Uh, autograft. Um, sometimes when people have a skin lesion and they need skin to cover that area, what they do is they get an autograft. They'll take some skin from one area of the body and put it in an area where they need that graft. And that's called an autograft. 
Okay, so that's just one type of a graph that we have. There's different types of graphs that we have. Uh, other graphs that you get from other people and stuff like that never last. They're just as a covering or dressing until the wound starts to heal from the inside out. So auto means self. Okay, uh, something that's autoimmune, you, you create an immune response against your own tissue. Bio, bio means life. Bio means life. So biology, the study of life. Logi means the study study of life brady we talked about this before means slow bradycardia slow heart rate okay con means together or with con together or with a word congenital um what congenital mean is something is born with something or some a kid is a baby is born with something it's called congenital okay like they have a congenital deformity we talked about the the kids who are who contract uh, 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 rubella inside the uterus they frequently have congenital abnormalities or congenital deformities because of that they're born with it so con means together or with okay so if something's confluent it means they're together so that makes sense okay so that's a word that you might have used already this we've had this before bad difficult or painful dysuria is painful urine okay you we had before easy well good normal eupnea nice easy breathing that was a word we had before hetero different heterosexual different sexes makes sense okay homeo homeo means likeness or the same the body likes to be the same and that the body likes it to be the same is called homeostasis the body whether you want to believe it or not while you're sitting here listening to this boring lecture okay uh, what happens is your body is making minute by minute, second by second changes to try to keep your body the same all the time. Okay, uh, all the uh, chemical processes in your body, temperature, chemistries, all kinds of things are being kept within a very narrow range of normal, and that's called homeostasis. The body likes that. What we find is disease. One of the problems that we get with disease is it upsets the apple cart. It sort of stops this homeostatic control, which then causes certain organ systems to start to fail. And that's what we get with a lot of disease. So homeo means likeness or same. Homo means the same as well. Something that's homogeneous means it's made. Genius, you know, means formation. It's made of the same stuff. So if, in other words, if I see a tumor, and if I looked at an x-ray and the inside of it looks the same on an x-ray, and you open it up and you look at it, it's a big ball of gel or something like that, guess what? It's all homogeneous or homogeneous or homogeneous. Uh, basically, it means it's all the same material. Okay, it's the same material. Hydro, we talked about before, means water. Hydronephrosis. When people have a kidney stone, what happens is they can't get rid of the urine because the tube that, that allows the urine to come from the kidney down to the bladder gets blocked by the stone. Therefore, the kidney starts to fill up with a lot of urine. And when it fills up with urine or water, it's called hydro nephrosis and sort of like blows up a bit okay so that's hydro means hydrotherapy hydroelectric blah 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 all the same okay idio idio means individual you know uh something that's idiopathic is something that happens specifically to an individual a lot of times we have uh idiopathic responses or idiopathic diseases which basically it just occurs to that individual it's not like you catch it something like that but it's idiopathic it's just pertaining to an individual uh, an individual uh, incident or something like that. So idio, mean, idio means individual. Meta we had before means beyond or after. Metatarsals. The back part of the foot is called the tarsals, and area before that, the long foot bones are called the metatarsals. This area in the wrist are called the carpals. This area in the hand are called the metacarpals because they're beyond or after the carpals. They're beyond or after the tarsals. So meta means beyond or after. Pan means all, means all. Pancytopenia. Penia was a suffix we talked about was a deficiency or decrease. Hopefully you remembered that one from before. Cyto means cell. It's a word root that means cell. So deficiency and pan means all cells. Sometimes when people have something called an aplastic anemia, a without plastic formation, and without emia, blood, Okay, all those words, see how they all come together? It's all, ooh, man, this is sort of blowing my mind, okay? Everything sort of comes together, you know? I love it when a plan comes together. What happens is uh, sometimes when people take certain medications or they have certain illnesses or something like that, they get what's called a pancytopenia. They actually have a decreased formation of all the cells that are made of the bone marrow. So therefore, the, the white cells go down, the red blood cells go down, and the platelets go down. Somebody was that when things like leukemia, uh, cancer therapy, and stuff like that, as well as some simple things like antifungal treatment people take antifungals by mouth uh, certain antibiotics will cause this and stuff like that it may cause a pancytopenia okay so post means after like post-operative after surgery 
Okay, pseudo pseudo means false. Pseudo membranous. Pseudo membranous. Uh, o u s adjective uh, suffix. Mem membrane means membrane. Pseudo means false. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if you've you've ever. Uh, uh, heard of this? It's called C. difficile. C. difficile is a bacteria we all have in our gut. Okay, in our intestines, we have this bacteria. It's called C. difficile, but it's usually a small amount. And the other bacteria say, "Shut up, stay in that little crease, and don't come out." Okay, and, and all the other bacteria sort of control the C. difficile. What happens though is sometimes when people take certain antibiotics, it kills the normal bacteria in the gut, but not the C. difficile. C. difficile is like a kissing cousin of gas gangrene and stuff like that. Okay, and what happens is is it doesn't kill the C. difficile. All of a sudden, the C. difficile wakes up from one of those little creases, looks around, and all these other bacteria are gone. It says, "Hey, parents, away! It's time for a party." And what happens is it starts to invite more C. difficile and creates a membrane on the inside of the colon and stuff like that. Therefore, what the colon does is the colon doesn't absorb a whole lot of food. What it really absorbs is a lot of water. It's mostly for absorption of water in the large intestine before you get to the end. Okay. So as a result, what happens if this if if we get a lot of this membrane and inflammation and with this membrane and goop that's inside the colon, I can't absorb the water. So therefore, the fecal material becomes very watery or diarrheal. And as a result, people start to lose a lot of their body water because they have voluminous amounts of diarrhea and they lose a lot of body water, which then decreases their blood pressure and all kinds of bad stuff and some people were actually known to die from C. difficile so now they know about that a little bit more but basically a membrane was created in the colon that prevented that water so that would be a pseudo membrane because it's not really a, a true membrane it's false okay sim sim means joined together or with something that's symbiotic means it's joined together in life um, this is a scary thought what they're actually finding now is some bacteria uh, of different types of bacteria are able to talk to other types of bacteria in things like water. Somehow they're sending out chemical signals from one bacteria to another. And so if one bacteria might be resistant to a particular antibiotic, they may be able to send parts of that DNA or parts of something that will cause other bacteria to also be resistant. It's a scary thought because they're living together in nature and they find out that instead of having one, two actually make the, the situation better and they're symbiotic. They work, they're joined together in life. Syn also means joined or fused. Um, we have a joint that's called a synchondrosis. Basically, it's a joint that doesn't really move, but it's two pieces of cartilage that are fused together. They're joined together, or two cartilage. It doesn't really move. Okay. Uh, one area of a synchondrosis is the ribs actually stop part way up, and then it, it, they don't go direct, attach directly to the sternum with the bone. Between the end of the bone and the sternum is a chunk of cartilage, and that cartilage basically is joined. So basically, it's joined there. So tachy means rapid or fast. Tachycardia, rapid heartbeat. Ultra. Ultra means beyond or excess. Ultrasound. Uh, sound that's in excess of what we normally could hear. Okay, and that's why they call it ultrasound, above and beyond normal range of hearing. And these are some. Prefix, or suffix, or prefixes, excuse me. So what we've talked about so far in this video, or not so far, because <laughs> you're saying, oh no, can't go on much longer than that. I can't take any more of this. But what happens is what we've talked about so far is basically a lot of the prefixes that come up. And again, many, some of these you may not see a whole lot, but a lot of them you're going to see over and over and over and over and over again. These are common prefixes. They're not uncommon. OK, so uh, my suggestion is get these down pat. You're going to find that the homework for the uh, first uh, first quiz is basically a timed homework. It's a little it's a fun exercise that what you do is you actually run it on a PowerPoint and the slides will change every couple seconds. And basically there'll be a prefix or a suffix. And what you need to do on another piece of paper is it is to find the, the, the suffix or the prefix and then either say a P or an S, whether it's a prefix or a suffix. I'll give you more instructions when we closer to where that, that homework is due. But you, knowing these suffixes and prefixes, suffixes in a previous video and prefixes now, uh, basically really give you a good idea as to a lot of the words that we have. So if you know these right now and spend some time to learn these, it's going to help you all the way down the road. 
Okay, well maybe not the second module. Second module is a little bit strange, a little bit, a little bit uh, quirky. But what happens is uh, it's going to help you down the road in being able to understand a lot of the other terms that we have that we're going to be going over for the rest of the semester. So hope you've been able to follow this, and uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. Remember prefix at the beginning of the word, uh, we, whether and the same rules regards to uh, combining vowel and not as we have with the suffix and stuff like, and the word root and stuff like that. So all these things are pretty consistent. So now we've gone uh, much deeper into the prefixes. And and hopefully um, you're going to build in the number of, of, of the, uh, your armamentarium of what you know by learning these uh, prefixes here, as well as you did learn the suffixes and, and how to put them together with some uh, a very limited amount of word roots at the beginning. So hopefully this all makes sense to you. Um, and, and go over this as many times as you want, 15 to 20, I'm sure. Yeah, right. Okay, not in my lifetime. But anyway, uh, in the meantime, before the next video, um, uh, stay safe, uh, stay healthy, and uh, we'll talk to you. And bye-bye.